All right, solution time. So I'm hoping it's pretty straightforward to describe a linear motion from one point to another, because um, we've done a lot of that. Um, so if you wanted to, you could make these be specific coordinates. If you wanted to, you could write out the X of T graph and the Y of T graph. Um, but I don't think any of that is required because before when we talked about how to think about this kind of thing, you could think about a vector that points at your starting location. And then you can think about another vector that points in the direction of the line that you want to be tracing. So in this case, the vector that points to the starting location is literally the same as P1. And then um, it's very easy to construct a vector that points in the direction of this line. Um, all I have to do is figure out how far over and how far up between point one and point two. So if you think about kind of how this picture makes sense, it's like this change in x is the difference between x1 and x2. Um, but because it's moving to the left, I know that that number needs to be negative. Um, so what we'd actually have is x2 minus x1 should give us that change in x. And y2 minus y1 should give us the change in y. So you could construct it that way. Um, but you can write it all in terms of vectors like this. You could say p1 plus p2 minus p1. And then that's what's scaling with time. So graphically speaking, p1 is this vector. p2 minus p1 is this vector. Um, and an easy way to see that is if you think about moving along this vector plus that vector, it should give us a vector that points directly to p2 because of the rules of addition. So think about what I get if I say p1 plus p2 minus p1. Algebraically, p1 and minus p1 make 0. So that just gives us p2. And so you can see sort of algebraically, if I add those two vectors together, it gives me the vector that points straight at p2. So that's another way that it makes sense. So I can call that. Uh, point A, and point A is a vector that's changing with time. Um, B is really exactly the same. So if I'm going to make this one be B, and B is moving from point 2 to point 3 between times 0 and 1, um, it's everything's exactly the same. So I'm going to have a vector that points to the starting place at P2, and then I'm going to have a vector that points from P2 to P3. And so that's going to be p3 minus p2 scaled with time. Um, and I hope you can see kind of why it makes sense that a point that moves from here to here in one second should have the same equation or an equation of the same form as a point that moves from here to here in one second. Like all we, we've kept the form, all we've done is changed which points are the starting point and the ending point. OK, so what about the last step? The last step is as point A moves this way and point B moves that way, we're going to imagine a line between them. And we're going to imagine a point C that's move, or let's call it, yeah, sure, let's call it C, um, that's going to move from point A to point B between zero seconds and one second. So we can use the exact same structure here. C is going to be. Um, a vector that points to the starting location, which is A, plus a time scaled vector that points from A to B. So I can start with my vector A, which is the same thing as this entire equation up here, plus time, whoops, times B minus A. Um, so it's really just the same thing kind of over and over and over again. Um, so this is a correct mathematical expression of the path that this point C takes. Um, but it would be nice to write it out. If we want to see it in Desmos, remember, we need to be able to write it out as uh, like all of the x components are gathered together and all of the y components are gathered together. So that, that way we can view it as a parametric. So let's take a look and see what that would look like. All right, so we've got our three equations. And remember, point 0.1 is x1, y1, and point 0.2 is x2, y2, and so on. So let's rewrite each of these equations in a simplified form. Or I mean, this is already pretty simple. I should say in a form where we've combined all of the x components together and all of the y components together. 
Um, so I'm going to rewrite this over here. So P1 is the same thing as x1, y1. And then we've got time times P2, which is x2, y2 minus x1, y1. All right, so let's do now a lot of simplifying algebra. So I can combine these two together as x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1. Um, and t is still here. And all the rest of this stuff is still here. Um, so I can multiply t in. So that's going to give us t times x2 minus x1, and then t times y2 minus y1. And then this is the same. And now I can combine the x's from these two vectors and the y's from those two vectors. So altogether, I've got x1 plus time times x2 minus x1, and y1 plus time times y2 minus y1. Oh, sorry. Parentheses. OK, great. So this, this is now a single vector. Ta-da. This is now a single vector where that is our x component, and this is our y component. You might look at where we started and where we ended up and think about why it should make sense that the equation looks this way. So here we said let's start at a point 1 and then add time times the difference between point 2 and point 1. And that's the same format that we ended up with down here. It's just that we've separated out the x's and the y's. So here for the x, we're saying we're starting at x1 and then as time increases, we're going to add the difference between x2 and x1. So that's exactly the same as the format here, except now it's just about x specifically because it's the x component. And here it's about y specifically. Um, so you could, you could have like approached this whole thing backwards. You could have started by thinking about how do I think about x's by themselves, and you would have come up with this equation and then you would have gone through the y process and you would have come up with this equation. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think it's nicer to think about the x's and y's at the same time rather than separately um, up here. At least once you get comfortable enough, that's a good approach. If it, that doesn't feel comfortable, then you can apply the strategy of thinking about them separately. So following that same way of thinking, I can take this equation, b of t. You could do this yourself and do the whole simplifying process. Um, but we can really imagine just jumping straight to the answer, um, which is going to be x2, because we start at point 2, and then plus t times uh, point 0.3 minus point 0.2. So it's going to be the x value for point 0.3 minus the x value for point 0.2 multiplied by time. And then same thing for the y's. So y2 plus time times y3 minus, oops, why? Ah. <clears throat> y2. There we go. So at last we're ready to do this third one, the point that moves from the one moving point towards the other moving point. So now that we've written a and b out as vectors, we can write c out as a vector. Um, so let's do that. So here I've rewritten the equations for a and b. And the c vector was the vector that starts at a and moves along the vector that points from a to b. So our task is we want to rewrite this equation, but plugging in uh, what we actually know uh, a and b are. This is going to take up a huge amount of horizontal space. So I'm actually just going to do the x components first and then the y components second. So this notation I'm making up a little bit. but. Um, we want to look at just the x component for the c vector. And so I'll just take the x component from the a vector and add it to the time scaled vector that's the difference between the x component and the y component from b and a. So let's just go ahead and plug it all in. And now we can start to simplify.
Okay, let's take account of where we are. So I have distributed in the t here. So I rewrote all of these terms, but with an additional factor of t multiplied. Um, I wrote little dashes here just because I didn't want to rewrite this part. Um, but a nice thing to do now would be to start to combine terms. What I'm noticing here is I've got constants that don't have a t at all. So that's like x1. And then I've got terms that have a single power of t, like t times x2. And then I've got terms that have t squared in them. So what I think I want to do is I think I want to gather together like all of the terms that are the t squared terms and then factor out the t squared. And then all of the terms that are the t terms and factor out the t and then all of the constants so that that way it will look like a quadratic equation for t. So let's start by gathering together all of the t squared terms. Um, so none here, and then I see one there, and one here, and not that one, and then this one, and then this one. Okay, so I'm gonna take those four and I'm gonna rewrite them here at the beginning. So I'll have t squared x3, t squared x2. Uh, oh, so here I've got two t squared x2s. So let's actually just write two of those. And then last I've got a t squared x1. Okay, and then if I wanted to, I can take this. These all have a t squared in them, so I can take out the t squared. And so I'm left over with x3 minus 2x2 plus x1. All right, so now let's gather together so I'm going to cross these out because I've done them. So now let's gather together all of the uh, terms that have a single t in them. So that would be this one, this one, this has a t in it, this has a t in it. So those four. Okay, so if I'm going to write those here, I've got t times x2 minus t times x1. And then here I've got another t times x2, so that's two of them. And then here I'm subtracting t times x1, uh, so that makes two of those as well. Because I had a negative and then I'm subtracting another, so now that's like subtracting two of them. So let's do the same thing, let's factor out the t. And now I've got just 2x2 minus 2x1 times t. Okay, so far so good. So now I'll cross those out because I've handled those. So it seems like the only term that I haven't dealt with is the x1, so I'll just write that one at the end. And so now I've got a final solution that is a quadratic function for t, because notice I've got like a bunch of stuff times t squared plus a bunch of stuff times t plus a constant. And if this seems all difficult to track, remember what I said at the beginning, you want to focus on um, which, which of these things are actually numbers that we know and which of these things are variables. The only thing that's a variable is t. Everything else, all these x1, x2, x3, those are all the coordinates of the control points that we started with. So this is sort of like saying a big number times t squared plus a number times t plus a number. And so clearly that has the form of a quadratic equation. So you could go through that entire process again for the y components, um, but notice that the patterns are exactly the same. Uh, the only thing that would be different would be me replacing the x1 and x2 and x3 with y1, y2, and y3. So I don't really need to do that. I can just immediately jump to the same answer because I know if I followed the same process, the answer would be the same. So let's go ahead and do that. And so now we can type those into Desmos. Okay, and then last of all, uh, we should fix this bizarre error where uh, clearly x1 is here, so this should also be x1. I don't know why I wrote x2. Um, and then that should also be y1. Cool. Um, now let's for real type it into Desmos. So here I've done that. Uh, I'm calling my first equation p subscript x for the points x and the second p subscript y for the points y. You could just click all to add sliders. I think it's a little bit nicer to actually define a point by typing x1 comma y1 and then hitting enter because that also creates your sliders but the sliders are attached to this draggable point. 
So I'm gonna do that for the rest of them. X2, Y2. Oops, let's get all of our points together up at the top here. X3, Y3. Great, so now I've got three movable points. Uh, let's go ahead and define the parametric curve. So again, I'll have a point, but this point is defined as P subscript X of time and P subscript Y of time. And you can see now we've got some draggable endpoints and this control point in the middle pulls the curve towards itself, um, which is pretty cool. Like what a, what a neat generalizable little design tool you've made. So that may be more algebra than you uh, are comfortable doing yet. Um, I don't know how that compares to last course, um, but that amount of algebra is like a pretty standard amount of algebra to need to work, you know, in a problem like this. Um, so if that was a lot for you, um, that's great. It means it's your first step towards, uh, you know, real problems. Um, what helps me, like the first time I went through this, you know, it did feel like a lot, but if you kind of go back over it, try and reproduce it yourself from scratch without looking at the produced solution, um, over time, you can really try and process the big strategic moves because um, a lot of the algebra is just kind of everyday, like combining of terms, distributing things. Um, and you have to have good attention to detail, not to make mistakes. Um, but and as far as a problem solving process goes, it's not terribly complicated. So you want to step back from all of the details and pay attention to what were the big strategic moves? Like how did you decide what your goal was at different points? Because that's, that's the piece that you'd need to remember in order to be able to do this again from memory. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Good luck, everybody.